guys, welcome to Laurie's Little Studio. I'm Laurie, and today I have this in front of me. I had a request recently to go over the Bernina 1080 Special, which is what George is. If you've been with me for a while, you're familiar with George. He's a workhorse. I've had him for a long time, my favorite sewing machine that I've ever owned. I'm, I'm very careful with my sewing machine. What I'm looking for at the moment is the cloth that I use to wipe. I've got some dust on here. It came with one of my, aha, there it is. In the world that I live in, there's always dust. And I feel like it's just a good idea to get it removed before you start sewing. Now I'm going to admit I looked all over the house for my sewing machine manual for this machine. And although I saw it recently, I've been tripping over it for three years, all of a sudden it has decided to vanish. So it's possible, it is possible, that at some point I will find it. And if I do, I'll kind of go back over some of those um, items that I'm gonna to touch on today. All right, so this little needle track here is something I used to sell in my shop and it does, it did not come with this sewing machine. It is just a simple little device that helps Uh, someone who is sewing mark the needles that they're using and I'll show you what I mean by that get George turned over here just so we can get this part of the discussion out of the way there's the brand name needle track I used to sell these in my shop and it has needle type over here so universal ballpoint um, Sharps, denim, those are in the same category. Embroidery, stretch, metallic, top stitch, quilting, and a special needle. And then over here, it has the size. So it starts up here at 6080, and it ends up down here at 120 slash 19. And so what you do is move this little dial up and down. So let's say you have a universal. So we'll move him all the way up to universal and you are using a universal 7010 right there. So I can look at this and say, oh, the needle in my sewing machine is a 7010 universal. If I take out this needle that's currently in my sewing machine, I can use this as a way to remind me that that's what I took out put in a different needle, for example, a twin needle, and then when I go back to put the regular sewing machine needle in, I'll remember that it was a Universal 7010. So that's what those are for. If you do a lot of um, switching around of your needles, that's a good, um, a good way to kind of keep up with what you got going on. Okay, so I'm gonna leave George just over here. And I'm going to talk about this. This is the basically the gas pedal. It is called the foot pedal and it attaches to your sewing machine with one of these if you have the 1080. Mine says Swiss made. The outlet that attaches for power is the same type right here. It only goes in one way and um, it also just plugs in on the side of your sewing machine. So let's take this right here and I am going to just simply take a picture and I'll pop it right here. So the foot pedal right here attaches in the picture that I just popped up. 
this outlet right here. And it will only go one way. You can try to put it the other way, but it won't work. And then for the power cord, now mine is currently plugged into my outlet on the other end. So when I plug in my sewing machine, I have power, I'm ready to go. Um, there is a slot on the top of your outlet plug right here. And let me get a close up of this. There is a slot receptacle that that slot on this fits into. So that's the way that it plugs in. If you try to plug it in a different way, it won't work. Okay, so this is supposed to be on the floor right by the foot, your, your foot that you want to sew with, you want to push the pedal with. I keep mine on the right side and I use my right foot which I'm not going to show. I'm going to explain how to use the foot pedal and we're just going to keep it like that. Okay, so to describe the, the power buttons side of the sewing machine right here, I'll take a few pictures, but I will also kind of describe it from this point right here. I do want to see if I can change my light. We'll see if that works. So this one, which I will pop a picture of it up so that you can see that. This is the on and off. If the dark portion of this button is pointing this direction, your sewing machine is on. If it's pointing down to the little zero, I think I've gotten photos of that, that means the sewing machine is turned off. I do recommend keeping your machine off if it's not in use. This button right here, the little up and down mountainy looking bits indicate that your feed dogs are up. The Crosshatch right here indicates that your feed dogs have been lowered and we're going to discuss that in just a second. Before I move on from this side, you will also notice that there is a dial and there's often this little gadget. This little gadget that fits into the side of your sewing machine is a needle threader. I've never really had good luck with it, but I don't need it, and I'll talk about how to thread the needle. It, this machine does not have an automatic needle threading option. It's threaded the old-fashioned way, and I find that to be a little bit easier for me. I have a brother sewing machine that does have an automatic needle threader and it can be kind of frustrating. I have a really hard time using it. I prefer to be in control of that myself. If you need a sewing machine that does offer an automatic needle threading option, the 1080 is too old and does not have that technology. Okay, so we're going to get back to the parking lot and discuss what I said we would discuss. All right, so this right here, let's see, let's get this on. We're gonna take a photo of this. Get my, this right here is the throat plate. And that's where the feed dogs are. Remember we were talking about this button that will raise them or lower them. So I need to remove the walking foot that I have on my machine. They say you should do puzzles to uh, keep your brain sharp. Just put this on your sewing machine, take it off your sewing machine, and then fit it back in the box and you've done 
enough puzzles for one day. Okay, so what I'm going to do is bring my camera down a little bit so that we can maybe get a little bit better view of this machine. So let me do that real quick. All right. Now this may or may not work having my camera down this low. Usually it's way over my head, but we're going to see how that works. All right, so this right here is the throat plate. I'm going to remove my needle so I don't get stabbed. We'll talk about that as well. I'm going to pop my needle. I always, if I take out a sewing machine needle out of my, um, out of my sewing machine, that's not too old. It's not old enough to get rid of it. I put it in my, I have a, a whole bunch of uh, pin cushions, but if I put this in sideways, like this, instead of straight up and down, like that, then I know sideways means I'm still using it. So in order to access where the bobbin is and to put a bobbin in, take a bobbin out, check for bobbin issues, you have to drop your feed dogs down into this little cavity right here. Okay, so they are raised at the moment. I don't know if you can tell, but they are raised. Now, to drop them, I'm going to turn that little dial over here, and now they are recessed. I'm going to take a video with my phone. I'll pop it up in here. It'll be different looking. Okay, so these are currently up. You know, there they are. And now I'm going to lower them. All right, so what that does is it allows me to remove this metal throat plate, which I desperately need to do because I did not clean George on purpose so that you would be able to see what you're not supposed to see. The th what I'm going to reveal is the lint from thread and fabric that has accumulated around the feed dogs. But I can't get this off. The sewing machine would be very uncomfortable to use if, if, if this were loose and flimsy and was easy to, to manipulate. So what I have to do is use this little thumb guide right here and pop that little door open. And there is where the bobbin lives. But it reveals this little lip right here that I can push up on. I use my thumb. And now it will come off. And there it well, it's not as bad as I thought it was going to be. I Like I said earlier, I keep George very clean. Um, the way that I work on keeping George clean is I take a paintbrush that I'm no longer using or in the case of this black one, I never ever did use for painting. This one I did use for painting, but it's now, and has been for quite some time, used to keep this sewing machine clean. Okay, so I'm going to try to do this with George tipped back a little bit. I'm not having a whole lot of luck getting good footage from the overhead camera, but it's a little bit easier to film because I don't have to hold my phone. However, now I'm having to hold George, who weighs infinitely more. So let me take off this foot just to kind of open up a little bit of space. Now, George is cleaned up and almost always looks like this every time I start a project and when I finish a project. The reason for this is I paid a lot of money for George new, and that was like 20-something years ago. 
and I want George to stay with me as long as possible. I love my sewing machine and I feel like it's important to me to kind of keep this part working like it should. I mean all the rest of it also needs to be in good working condition but this is something that I can control by cleaning and maintaining and making sure that everything looks good. So I use a, a paintbrush, a small paintbrush. If you purchase your sewing machine new, they often come with a little brush. I have two and I use them just to kind of pick up the lint. Now you can see there is lint on this brush and I literally just cleaned George yesterday. So I'm going to drop George down on top of the bobbin box. Hope it stays. Okay, and then I just kind of wipe it off with my fingers and then I'm gonna do that a few more times. And I'm going all, let me see if I can, yeah, right along the sides. And trust me, this is very light pressure. I'm not jamming this brush in there and then forcibly, you know, scooshing it around. That's a word, by the way. I also take care of the upper part, this section where the needle is. However, I like to put either a piece of paper or my little dusting cloth, like so, and then take care of gently removing the dust from this area as well. And I can see, look, right there, there's a big blob of it. I don't want it to fall down into the machine, so I just make sure that I keep it covered up and wipe it all off. Okay. And I just get this out of the way shake it off over the garbage can. That's what I like about these cloths. They come clean just with a little bit of, uh, you know, shaking them off. Okay, and then I can put my throat plate back on. And you wanna make sure that it looks good too. If it has lint, that needs to go. I always kinda of check it out, make sure nothing is bent or out of place. And then, If you've already loaded up your bobbin, just pull this to the front and then um, in order to keep it simple, you can just kind of grab that thread and pull it down into the lower area. I'm not going to worry about that. Nah, let's just leave that alone. So we're going to pull these two threads to the front. And then I start from back here and then just gently, and remember my feed dogs are down. They have to be down in order to work, in order for this to work. And then just kind of go up over the top of that little peg and then it'll just snap in place like so. Now my th bobbin thread is caught, so I need to grab onto it with the needle thread and pull it up just like that okay so it just came and went it just got looped around it got looped around this thread when it went down into the bobbin area and then when I manually wound the little flywheel um, up, it pulled this with it. Now all of these things need to be done slowly and carefully, not quickly and without care. Okay, now if we're going to put this foot back on, which I don't think I'm going to, I'm going to put my number one foot back on. Right here, we just go ahead and it will fit right on that post. 
think I can get that. So there's a post right here. This is going to have to be turned. You can kind of see it back there. And then the foot goes on. And it will only fit in a proper way. It won't, you can't force it to go on um, incorrectly. It won't happen. Sometimes I just put my finger under the toes and then pull down on the little crank <clears throat> that locks that into place. I'll see if I can show you what that looks like. It's this right here. It's a little lever. If you lift it up into the back, it will loosen and you can remove the foot. If you bring it down and over the foot peg right here, then the foot is on and it won't come off. Okay. Full disclosure, I had to completely refilm because I could not find the footage that I did prior. So this is like three or four days later. Everything is different. The lighting is different. I am different. Everything is different. But I hope it was okay and we're just going to see. Alright gang, so next I'm going to show you how to put the sewing needle into the receptacle for your needle. If I had my manual I would know exactly what that's called. So the flat end, the flat side of the needle goes toward the back. You will be able to feel that, trust me. And then you just pop it into that little needle holding thing. I use a fingernail to hold it in place like so and then I tighten the little screw. It does not have to be so tight that you have to use a screwdriver to unscrew it. Finger tight is fine. Any more than that and I think you might even damage your sewing needle. Now conversely you do not want your needle to come out while you're sewing. That would be very 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 detrimental. So tight enough to hold the sewing needle and you can check it. Just tap on it and see if it's nice and snug. Okay, and then I'm going to drop my tripod down just a wee bit. Now we've got our throat plate back in place. We have a needle in the machine. The feed dogs are still low. They have not been raised back up. How do you get them back up? Well, you turn that little dial over here on the right side of the sewing machine to where it looks like little mountains. I'll pop that picture up once again right here so that you will be able to see what I'm talking about. Now, did that pop them up? No, they're still very firmly down. The only way to get these to pop back up is, of course, the sewing machine has to be turned on, which I just did, and you have to turn this dial. Then, after that, you turn the flywheel on the side, that big round dial, I'll pop that picture up again, right here. You turn it toward you. You do not turn it towards you and then away from you and then towards you and then away from you. You do not do that. You only turn it toward you. And now the feed dogs are back up where they're supposed to be. So now we have to thread the sewing machine. The, and the reason for that is we, we want to bring up our bobbin thread, but it won't come up until it has a thread from the needle to loop over. When it loops over that thread, it will come up through the hole where it needs to come up. So let me grab some thread. I'll use this blue. Well, I don't want to use the blue. I'm going to use 
I guess I'll use this brown. And what I do, my as we said earlier, the bobbin is releasing the thread. I don't know why I'm going this way. Clockwise. And I want my needle to pull off of this spool counterclockwise. I'm going to, let me move this back where you can see what I'm doing. All right, I'm going to put my thread spool on and check to see that it is removing counterclockwise, which it is. If you watch the word Guterman, it will be going around. There we go, okay. And the first spot is right here. I just slip my thread underneath that little doohickey right there. I'm going to slot it through the first tension guide. So there's this little there, I think you can see it. It's real hard to see, but it's in there. All right, right here. It's going to spill out of this, and we're going to go down to the next point, which is right here. And we're going to go around from the right side up to the left. The reason that that only makes sense that direction is because if I went the other way, there's nothing over here for me to attach to. So it's going to come down, loop over. Now this should be in the very top position. If it isn't, turn that dial on the side over here until it is. And you're only turning it toward you. And you're gonna go up and you're going to loop it. So here is this little split right here. I don't know if you can see. The main arm is right here and then there's a split. And you want this thread to go right into that little split. All right, and then it's going to come down and let me move my camera again. It's going to come down and let me turn my camera phone camera back so on. So this is that little bar that wraps around your sewing needle right here. You're going to take this thread and you're going to loop it right through it so that your thread is attached to this piece and is now resting on the front side of your sewing needle. If you let go of it, it's not going to go wild. It's just going to stay there because it's kind of clipped into place. I'll move this. I don't know if that's going to help or hurt, but it's this right here. Okay. Now, a lot of people, for whatever reason, want to wet their fingers. I don't know why. I've never understood that. So they want to just lick their fingers and then wipe those wet fingers on their thread. When you do that, the thread opens up and spreads apart. It just says, oh, I'm like a wet paper towel and I'm just going to open up and spread apart, making it thick. And it doesn't want to go through the eye of the needle. If you don't get it wet, if you leave it alone, you should be able to just pop it right through, just like that. I don't know if you can see, but my needle is now threaded. If you cannot get it to thread, even though you've not wet the end of the thread, then take a pair of scissors whatever you happen to have on hand that will cut and angle your scissors over the top of your thread. So here's the thread right here. Here's the scissors and just cut your thread oops, at an angle. I know you can't really see that you've done it, but you have. 
Now you have a nice, nice sharp point. Avoid getting the thread wet. However, let's just hold the thread off to the side and we're gonna take our forefinger and our thumb and run it over the needle. The reason we do that is two. We have two, two reasons for that. The first one is we want to check for burrs. Do we feel any weird little messed up parts on our needle? I don't. The other thing that happens when we do that is we remove, for the most part, static electricity for a moment and it won't make our thread just like, no, I'm not going to go near that needle. No, I won't do it. So just run your fingers down, check for burrs, remove the static electricity, and then you can just push that thread right through. Now, check to make sure that the thread is on top of the sewing needle and it did not loop around the point. You just want a nice, smooth, straight piece of thread lying on top of that needle. Okay, now you can hold this if you wish, I usually do, and then turn the flywheel on the side all the way one rotation only toward you, never ever backward away from you. All right, it's gonna catch onto the bobbin thread. When it does, you can just pull and there is your bobbin thread right there. Lots of people just use their sewing scissors to just pull it up and do that however you wish. And then you can close that little um, door that hides the bobbin back there. Okay, so at this point, you have your bobbin thread, you have your throat plate, you have the, uh, you have your presser feet, and you have your needle all doing what they're supposed to be doing. So at this stage, as long as the needle is threaded and the bobbin is threaded and everything is in the proper place, you would think we could sew. Well, there's a couple other things that we gotta check. So we have to check on the tension. And you can see mine has been, this red bar is not matching up with this red bar right here. I like to start with those two matched up. Why did I say start with? Well, because when I'm sewing something, depending on the project, I'm going to check the tension by using a piece of cabbage. Cabbage is leftover little bits and bobs of fabric. So the what I do is I check the tension on my sewing machine to match with the tension that I need for my project and my fabric. So what I have to do is find my foot, okay. All right, so this is just my number one Bernina foot, and that's a whole different discussion. I have my machine set on the recommended default everything. So the default needle tension, it is in straight stitch mode and then my stitch width is set at zero that's default and my stitch length is set at two now I can change these as much as I want to but for the moment I'm just going to go ahead and do one row of stitches now the thing of it is I don't normally stitch on one single layer of fabric so when I do a sample stitch to check for tension and whatever stitch I want to use, if I'm checking it for that as well, I will fold my cabbage in half like so because 
I normally will be stitching on either folded over or two pieces of fabric. Now the other feature that I want to use, and I almost use it all the time, is the needle down. It is a picture of a sewing needle with an arrow. And again, I don't know if you can see it or not. I, my camera's, oh, my phone is facing away from me, but this right here, I will engage that by pushing the button so that little light comes on. I put my foot on my gas pedal down there on the floor and I start stitching. Now, what I do when I start stitching doesn't have anything to do with the sewing machine, but I hold my threads with my pointer finger, my bobbin thread and my needle thread so that they don't end up underneath my project. I do that with every sewing machine. Now as you can see with needle down, I, I basically have a third hand. I can raise this presser foot if I need to and my fabric is not going to shift out of place. It's where it needs to be. Okay. Now one of the things about the 1080 is it has a, it, it can stitch very, very fast, and I will show you that right now. But it also has a way to slow it down to half speed by pushing the button that's next to needle down. And that, no matter how far I push on this foot pedal, it will only stitch half speed. So, if I want to go fast, I make sure that's not engaged. Now, to raise this needle so that it's up and I can remove my fabric, I take my foot on my foot pedal and at the very end of the foot pedal, the back end closest to me, I just push on it one time and it raises that needle. Then I can remove my fabric. There's a cutter on the side. Okay, so I'm going to look at my stitches and see what I think. I think they look very good. I don't need to change anything. My tension on the front and on the back looks fine. I like the way this looks. I think it's a nice looking stitch length for this cotton thread, or this cotton fabric, I mean. It looks very, very well put together. Okay, so if I'm going to be using different stitches in my project, so for example, let's say I'm going to be using the built-in zigzag stitch, I will switch it over to stitch number two on this one. Just push the button and it will move from stitch one to stitch two. Stitch one is straight stitch, Stitch 2 is a zigzag stitch, as evidenced by the little graphic that they have right there. So I'm going to check the tension on that one as well. Now remember, I'm going to push the back end of the foot pedal, and by back end I mean the one that's closest to me so that I lift that needle and I'm only going to press it one time. Okay, so once again I think we have a nice looking even stitch front and back. Looks really good, but let's say I wanted my stitches on this zigzag to be closer together. How would I achieve that? Well, I would definitely bring down my stitch length. So I will turn it down to say mm, one half. And on the front of that so of my sewing machine, it goes from zero to very tight. It just shows you some stitch lines 
to the number one half to the number one and then one and one half two two and one half three three and one half four and then five okay so I have brought it down to one half and we're gonna see if that's what I want I don't know yet I want to make sure that it is or eliminate it as an option Right, let's just check it out. So it's struggling a little bit. It looks like the stitches aren't very even. They're just kind of, hmm, not even. So in order to make that a little bit more even, it could be that I need to drop my stitch width down, which by the way, I forgot to mention, when I hit the number two button for zigzag, the default switched from zero to three on stitch width. So I'm gonna drop it down to one and one half. So I have length at one half and width at one and one half. There's quite a big difference between this one and, and this one here, which I think you can easily see. The stitches on this one are a little bit less erratic. There's still some stitches that aren't perfect, but now I'm going to drop my length down to just those straight hash mark lines and I'm going to go all the way down to one and we're going to see what happens. Okay, that's so tiny that I can't really see it. Okay, there toward the end I popped it back up to two on the width and left it all the way down on the satin stitch. Let's just see what we've got now. Okay, so we started out with this, which I don't like it. This is okay, but still kind of meh. This is way too tiny. I mean, it, I can see where it would have an application in some, some sewing, but this is what I'm looking for right here. That, I think, is more of a little small satin stitch, and it looks way better than what I thought was going to be the case and it's true on both the front and the back okay so I feel like I have my tension set well I'm back I took a lunch break and I went outside to water my raised garden beds that are on my deck out behind the house all right so what I wanted to talk about next is this right here this is a book that I started when I bought my Bernina, and it is my Heirloom Stitch Guidebook Bernina 1080, and I've had it for a long time, and we'll go over some of this. The main purpose of having this particular book is this right here, which I made myself a hem guide on this piece because this is that heavy cardstock paper and that's why it doesn't have stitches on it it just has a hem guide and of course the way that you use a hem guide is um, you take this to the ironing board and if you want a quarter inch um, folded under to, and then pressed you do that and then a half and then three-fourths and then one inch and you can just press your fabric along that line and then you have, that's one inch right there. So that's that's why I made this. But these are my how to achieve these stitches on this sewing machine. Now I have two boxes. This one came with my sewing machine. My big box that I bought as an accessory to the sewing machine. 
this box is rather large and it has places for some of your other uh, equipment. This is the little brush for cleaning the sewing machine that came with the sewing machine. Um, this is called a hump jumper and you put it underneath your foot as you're sewing. There's very specific use for this and I'm going to do another video on that but not today. Um, it's for like when you're sewing jeans or something that have a really big, huge, bulky seam. This helps with that process. There we go. All right. So I did manage to get all those extra feet in there. And then that just closes up. But to me, the best part about this entire box, this wonderful box, is what it does next. Okay. So we all know that if we have a free arm sewing machine, we have a little bit more, um, I don't know, uh, freedom with our machine. We can do a lot of things with this open. However, if we need a little bit more room, I don't know if you can see it. There's a little peg right here. I'll use the flashlight. And that might show us. There is this little peg sticking out. I think you can see it now. Right here. Okay. Well, there is a slot right here on this box that that fits onto. Now I have a bit bigger table to sew on. So without this box on here, that black line right there, so from here to here is how much room I have to balance my fabric when I'm sewing. However, if I leave the little box on, I have way more room to balance my fabric on. So it's almost like having a table, which I do have for George, that I will show you next. I have had to replace this centerpiece. That looks horrible, doesn't it? It was just a peg like this right here. I'm trying to get it where you can see it. Right here. And it kept breaking off. So my husband just retrofitted something from the garage using some type of silicone that nobody ever sees because this is the part that's on my machine. So let's go ahead and install that. So to take this off, we just pull from below and it just comes right off. So this table fits just like this. There is a groove right here that will utilize that little peg that I showed you before for the for the little box and it's going to slip right on to that little peg. These two, you can see that one there, this is the one my husband fixed, will pop into these little holes right there. And now I have a great big lifted table for my sewing machine which is super nice for when I'm sewing something that I need to support flush with the arm of my sewing machine. Usually that is something big, like, you know, a big, long, wide piece of fabric that would be about like this. So it, it helps to hold it up and you're not constantly fighting gravity as your fabric is falling off that 
arm edge right there. Now there are bigger tables that you can get, and I do happen to have one that is set up currently for Brother Louie. It is called the... Um, so steady. It's S E W S T E A D Y. So steady. Um, not affiliated, non sponsored. I just happened to buy one when I bought the Brother sewing machine because I needed it. So that's all of those. Now we're going to talk about a few of the other things that you can do with your uh, Bernina. 1080 special. All right, so I'm going to show you a little trick for making just one special stitch. And I just need some new fabric, so let me just tear off a piece. I just have some more white cotton here. I'm sorry. So now I'm going to Fold it in half, just like I did before. There's a little bit of static in the room, so I'm gonna keep my thread out of the way by hooking it on that side cutter over there. All right, let me get it set up so you can watch from down here. All right, stitch number 24 is like a Roman key. I don't know if my phone is catching that. If not, I'll pop a picture up for you to see it but you'll see it on the fabric, all right? So to catch one stitch, well, actually, you know what? If I do a Roman key, that won't make any sense. Let's do um, a flower. So we're gonna do number 28. There we go. Okay, I'm going to show you how to do a single stitch. Let's say you wanted to just do one flower. You did not want a whole row of flowers, just one flower. So what I usually do when I'm in a situation where I want to do something special like that is I reset the computer on my sewing machine by turning it off and then turning it back on again. Then, after I've got my fabric in position, I push the, the button for that design, which is number 28. Push that button. Then I push the single stitch button, and then I push the flower button again. All right, so here we go. We're going to do one flower. Now, I did not slow this, this machine down. My foot stayed on the foot pedal exactly as much, you know, depressed as I had it at the beginning of the stitch. It slows itself down and then it takes its final stitch. All right, now I'm going to move my foot to the back of the foot pedal and raise my needle by just tapping on the foot pedal one time. Okay, now raise my presser foot and I have one little flower right there. Just one little flower. But let's say that as cute as that is, I wanted to do a whole row of those around my, where in the other it is? Um, around, uh, say, a collar. I want to do a whole row and I want them to be like around the edge of a Peter Pan collar. What I have to do is hit this clear button right here, which I hope you can see. And that clears out all of my settings that I had. Now I'm going to push the flower button again, even though it's lit. I want my machine to know, yeah, I mean that one. That's the one I want. But I don't want you to just do one. I want to do all the way around this collar. Okay, so here we go. Okay, 
I didn't put it in needle down, so it stopped with needle up. All right, here are, oops, my little flowers. I, If I were doing that, to be completely honest with you, there would be some either wash away or tear away stabilizer in this, but I'm just showing you how to do this without getting a little, you know, ridiculously carried away. If you were going to actually be doing this on a garment, you would uh, for sure want to use some stabilizer. If you're not familiar with stabilizers, do a little bit of research on Google. You'll find basically what you need to know for the type of sewing that you are going to be doing. Okay, so the next thing after we learned how to do one single stitch is a mirror image stitch. And that is like that D, solid D, with a little broken line D going the other direction. That would be on your machine as well. Let's see if I can see. I don't know. It's right here. Okay. And the way we do that one is pretty much exactly the same as we did for a single flower. And that would be to, let's do a different, st I'm trying to keep all this staticky thread off of my hands. Uh, maybe if I put some lotion on, that'll help a little bit. Okay, so uh, let's choose, um, let's choose the glass. I call these glasses because they look like Harry Potter glasses. <laughs> and no affiliation, no non-sponsored, non just round glasses is what they remind me of. And it's number 25 on your sewing machine, Bernina 1080. So what you do is you push that button for that stitch. And then you push the mirror image button and then you push the stitch button again. So it will always be choose your stitch, choose the way you want to do it, and then choose the stitch again. Okay, and needle down, and here we go. This stitch is going in one direction. I'll draw it on this piece of fabric. So it originally looks like this ish that's what it would look like if I were stitching this stitch number 25 the circles would be circling to the left let's say I want the circles to circle to the right what I would do is turn on my machine, push this button for this stitch, then come down here and push mirror image, and then push stitch button again. Needle down. Okay. So now my circles are going to the right. So now I'm going to remove the mirror image option and I'm going to continue stitching. Okay. So you can see pencil is what I drew. This is what I was sewing in mirror image. Right here is where I decided, meh, I'm going to switch it mid-gear, and now it's going back the other direction. So that is what mirror image will do on the Bernina 1080. All right, um, this button right here is to make your stitches smaller than you can get them on your dial guides or bigger than you can get them on your dial guide. So let's say that we're doing a straight stitch, but we need to do a gathering stitch, and the gathering stitch needs to be really, really long. So I'm gonna set my stitch length up here to five, 
and I'm going to keep my width at zero because I don't need a zigzag. Okay. Now I've got it all the way up to five. Let's see what five looks like. Okay. So I'll draw a pencil mark where we stopped stitching at five stitches and I'm going to click the plus button say seven times. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I don't think it really goes much bigger beyond four or five, but I always give it a little extra. Okay, now I'm going to draw a line where we stop sewing with great big stitches and I'm going to go down to say one and I'm going to switch it to smaller stitches. Four, five, six, seven. <laughs> and that's pretty funny. And we're going to clear that out. I'm going to hit the clear button. C L R. I'm going to hit it a couple of times and I should be back in my normal default stitches for the last four or five. Okay, let's see what we have. So here I started out with about five stitches set, selected right there. Where that pencil mark is, is where I was getting longer stitches, and they are, it's hard to see, but they are longer. Then I moved it all the way down to the teeny tiniest possible stitch that I could get from about here to about here. Then I hit clear and I went back to my regular stitching. All right, so this is just a quick little video showing needle position because I can't find where I put the other video. But this is where that happens. It's on the front part of the sewing machine. And remember, these lights are not blinking in real life. Just the video is showing that. So if I push this little toggle right here to the left, one click, the light will move from zero to one position on the left side. And my needle will move. And if I push it again, it will move again. I'll put it back to center position and now I'm going to push the right side and again. Okay, so that's how that works. And then you just to recenter it, you either push these buttons to get it back to zero or you turn your machine off and turn it back on and then that will automatically reset it to the center position. I have a couple more things that I want to show you about the Bernina 1080 and then that's probably going to be it and I feel like anything else beyond what I'm going to tie this all together with here at the end we can do in another video. But I did want to show you buttonholes using the buttonhole feature on this uh, sewing machine and the way I do them. All right, so I pull my bobbin case with my bobbin thread out of the sewing machine. So there we have that. And I take the thread and I just poke it through the little hole on this little bar right here. So there's this little bar. I'm showing my camera on my phone. So if it's better footage, I can use it in the video. But then I'm going to thread that little hole with my thread just like this. And what that does is it adds a little bit more tension to your bobbin thread. Now go ahead and just load it up the way you would normally 
load up your bobbin. Pull your th bobbin thread up like so, close that little door. And then we're gonna talk about the two feet. So we have foot number three, and I don't know if these are focusing on the number, but that is just a regular number three. And then we have 3B. Now because the Bernina 1080 is considered a vintage sewing machine now, which is kind of depressing to me considering I bought it brand new. Yikes. There we go. Um, there are very few informational videos out about foot 3B. And I'll tell you, foot 3B for me is a luxury, but I don't often employ its use. However, it does have one fantastic feature. Three is a foot that I like to use a lot uh, because I'm pretty much in control of the buttonholes that I make. This one has two grooves on the bottom of the foot, right there. And then it has a larger groove in the toe area, and there are two slots, or three prongs. So take a look at that. And we're just going to make a really simple buttonhole with this three number three foot. So I've turned on my sewing machine and I have a folded piece of fabric, but I'm going to fold it so that I end up sewing through four pieces of fabric, okay? So for now, I'm just gonna set this here because I wanna show you the buttonhole stitch guide on the front of the sewing machine. And I'm gonna have to use my camera on my phone Once that stitch has decided it's done, the machine will then stitch down the, the left side again four times, real slow. So it'll be stitching along, and then it's gonna go one, two, three, four. Okay, let me put my camera back over here. Now what I do when I make a buttonhole is, Generally, I, oh, sorry. Let me bring it down a little bit more. Okay. Generally, I do it twice. So I'll do that entire thing that I just explained once, and then I'm going to go back and do it again. But I'm not doing that today because I'm running so low on thread. Okay, so I want to put my machine and needle down. And there we go. Now, the other neat thing that happens is when I push the buttonhole um, toggle on the front of my machine, this little light comes on over here that tells me that I need to use foot number three. Okay, so you sew along in a vertical line and then you push your button and you've got that horizontal and vertical line pop up and it automatically determines when it's time to start going back up vertically. And when you get to the top of the buttonhole that you started, you push just the single horizontal line and just be careful to watch. I'll see if I can zoom in a little bit. We'll see if it works. 
just watch when it comes down this side without assistance. There we go. So now the buttonhole has been stitched one time. Uh, granted, it doesn't look all that great because I'm not using any stabilizer. I'm just stitching on fabric. Oops. But it's not bad for a buttonhole. All right, so the next buttonhole foot is, of course, 3B right here. It attaches to the machine exactly the same way that all the other feet attach. The main difference is we have a red line right, my pointer just fell on the floor, right here, I think you can see it. So it's right there and then we have this little arrow guide right here. So what you can do is take your button and line it up with the red line up here and where the end of the button is just kind of scooch that little arrow up to where your the width of your button ends. Now you have a guide for how big your button hole needs to be. So we're going to go ahead and stitch this one same way. Sorry, my hand might be in the way. So when this little red line meets up with this arrow, that's when you're done. Okay, now you move your buttonhole uh, guide over here. And across the top, and it will also just stitch down the side and then be finished. Raise your foot, pull this out. Now you're basically going to get the same buttonhole I stitched over my thread appearance wise, but the reason that I decided to include this is to show you how to use the buttonhole um, feature on the machine. Um, but to make a buttonhole, I think would be a different, it would be a sewing lesson. So I will show you how I cut open your buttonholes here. So I'm going to insert a pin through all four bit pieces of fabric right on the end of the buttonhole, like this. And then I'm going to take my seam ripper and down at the bottom I'm just going to wiggle it in and then just gently push toward the pin. And voila! I have an open buttonhole. You can do it again. Being open the end of your buttonhole. But there we go. So. That is how basic buttonhole functionality on this machine works. I'm trying to think, oh, there's one other thing I wanted to show you. I'm gonna take it out of the buttonhole stitch and get another piece, I'll just use this one, another piece of fabric right here and put on Just a normal foot, number zero. And again, it just goes on same old way. Okay, and then I'm gonna say I'm just stitching along. Um, I'll use, just for the vibrancy of the whole thing, I'll just use a zigzag stitch. And I'm gonna stitch 
forward in just default forward mode. Okay, now let's say that I need to back up. So I have a reverse thumb button right here. You just push it with your thumb. If you have a long way to back up, there is the same feature here, right here on your sewing machine. So if you push this button, you are now going to be stitching in reverse the whole entire time. If you don't want to stitch in reverse the whole entire time, you just want to lock your stitches, just use this little button right here and you will go backward. Okay, and I'll show you what that looks like. So here we were going forward and here we backed up. And that basically concludes the features that I thought of that would be helpful for you. If you think there are other features that you would like to know how to use on this sewing machine, just drop a comment in the comment section below the description box on this video. If you liked it, please give it a thumbs up. If you haven't already subscribed, please consider doing so. And I will see you in the next one. Thank you. Bye.